Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. Lord. The child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about Jesus. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed so the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. This is the Gospel of Christ. So please be seated. Every one of us has a father and a mother. And that's an inescapable fact. And it's a biological thing, as well as, if you like, an emotional thing, a social thing, all the other things that are. And all these things, if you like, are tied together. <coughs> our biology, the nature of our bodies, the way we function as families, the way we function as people, the way we function as communities, as towns and villages and whatnot. And all these things kind of work together to make us what we are, to make us human. They are, if you like, part of the truth of our nature. And so, this, if you like, truth of our nature is bound together with our creation. The Lord made us in his image. The Lord made the universe. When he made it, it was very good. The whole of creation is a product of the Lord himself, of his truth, of his goodness, of his wisdom, of his holiness. And the things of creation reflect those qualities about its maker. And we can't, if you like, confuse this thing which he made, which is creation, which is the universe, which is us, with him himself. You know, a stone isn't God. <laughs> a stone is a stone. But the Lord made the stone, and it's good in its own way. And so, if we want to live, if you like, a life which is right, a life which is appropriate, and a life which you might say is wholesome, we need to live in agreement with what you might call our creation. We are made in a certain way, and the best way to live is to understand that way and to live in accordance with it. And if, if you like, we're trying to rebel against it, we'll give ourselves hardship, we'll give ourselves a hard time, we'll give ourselves pain and suffering, unnecessarily really, because pain and suffering are going to come to us whether we like it or not, whatever we do. But we'll just add to it if you feel like we'll rebel against what we really are. And you see that basic sort of fact that if you live a, a reckless and stupid life, you end up doing stupid things and reckless things, you end up hurting yourself. And so part of, I think, this theme of Mothering Sunday is, if you like, the wisdom of creation. It is how we are made. But this particular little fact carries with it, you might call moral obligation. Because in scripture it says, honour your father and your mother, and you'll live long in the land. It's not a, a negative commandment. It's not a thou shalt not. It's a positive one. Do this, if you like, and you shall live. And it's part of our creation. It's part of how we are made. But because the world is spoiled and fallen, it doesn't always work out so well. And so when we hear the word mother, for some of us we just feel a pang of loss. For some of us we feel pain. For some of us we just feel comfort and joy and happiness. I think for most people, the feelings are mixed. There's something fundamentally good about it though. 
there is something intrinsically truthful about it, which if we would be well, we would also acknowledge. I can't help thinking that some of this, this debate now in public life about the nature of male and female, about what a woman is and what a man is, about different kinds of marriage and stuff, it's actually deeply untruthful. It is contradictory to the nature of creation. And therefore it will cause hardship. It will cause suffering. Because by embracing it and living according to these things, we will be living in rebellion to our true nature, which is how we were made. And that is a grievous thing. And reality, I think, has a habit of biting back. In this story from Exodus, It's incredibly kind of terse. There's a lot that's not said. We never know who this man from the house of Levi is, or this Levi woman for that matter. We don't even know what she called her son. But they have a simple story of a man and woman getting married, they have children. You know that now this is at least her third child, because later on you hear about his older brother, Aaron, and you hear about his older sister, Miriam. Miriam would seem to be the oldest of all, although she's probably not very big at this time. <coughs> and it says in the scripture that the, the, the Egyptians wanted to kill all the Hebrew babies because they felt threatened by this population of Hebrews in their midst. They wanted to destroy them. And so his mother could not bear to see her son killed. Her heart went out to her little baby. And while he was tiny, she could, if you like, conceal him. But then, when he got too big, she could conceal him no more. She had this terrible, heartbreaking decision about what to do. Should she yield him to the Egyptian authorities, who might just kill him there and then? She couldn't go through with that. And so she made this little basket. And he's curious how they describe how she made it. Because it says she wove it out of papyrus, which is the reeds which you find everywhere in Egypt. And it says she plastered it with bitumen and pitch. Now, of course, pitch is something you get out of trees, but bitumen is the stuff that comes out of the ground. It's basically crude oil that comes out of the ground in places in, in, um, in the Middle East. And it was very used very commonly as a, a basic kind of material in that kind of region of the world, especially in what we now call Iraq where it was used as a cement for building, it was used for waterproofing things, it was used as glue, it was used in all kinds of ways, because it was kind of just there, you could dig it out of the ground, it just kind of came up, and then they found ways of utilising it. And so she had this bit of pitch, and she smeared it over this basket to waterproof it. The actual word in the Bible in Hebrew is a teva, and that word is used twice in the whole of the Bible. It's used once of this, this basket with a lid that's smeared with pitch. She puts the baby inside, puts the lid on, and then it floats off on the river. And funnily enough, the other time it's used, it's used for something made by someone else for a very similar purpose, but on a different scale. Noah made a teva, and he climbed in it himself and floated away on the river. But his was much bigger. Anyway, this little basket is floating on the river, and the princess of Egypt comes down to find it by the river. Now, the Egyptian pharaohs could be quite prolific in children. Like Ramses II had about 70 sons or something ridiculous, so he probably had about 70 daughters as well. So the fact she was a daughter of Pharaoh doesn't mean that she's particularly singled out. There's quite a lot of them around. But nevertheless, she was a woman of some prestige and some authority. And presumably a certain amount of autonomy she could do among, you know, within certain parameters pretty well what she liked. And so she decided to keep this baby. <coughs> so this baby, this story already is a story of a mother's longing, her heartache, a story of abandonment, and a story of adoption. She decides to keep it. But of course she's not the actual mother of this child. And it's quite common in antiquity, and even quite common in Britain until not that long ago, for a woman to pay another woman to nurse her child. 
because infant formula wasn't available. It's been well known since ancient times that cow's milk isn't that great for children. And so there was advice given by doctors, you know, medical papers and things, that if, you, if a woman can't feed her own child for some reason, they need to find another woman to do it, or give them goat's milk. Goat's milk has always been reckoned as better for babies. But here, Miriam runs out and says, shall I find you a nurse? Because of course, Pharaoh's daughter hasn't got any babies of her own, as far as we know. So she, she would need to feed this child. Yes, of course, she says, yeah, find me a nurse, great stuff. I don't have to bother looking myself. And so the, the baby's own mother ends up being paid to look after her child. An extraordinary kind of irony. You might say putting her little baby on the river was almost like a kind of prayer. She was saying to God, God, I can't bear to see my child die. Please, Lord, take care of my child. But she was truly letting go of him. She couldn't hold on to him. She had to let go of him. And that's one of the deepest wrenches among us, I think, if you've ever loved your child. That, that once sometime we've got to let go of them. And there's a terrible pang as you do that. And when my own children were born, I felt this overwhelming love for them. And at the same time, that produced in me a kind of fear. Because it's so overwhelming. And it's so deep, it always made me want to run away. And hide from it. It's a temptation to harden the heart and not do it, because it just seems too much. And it seems too terrible. You think, how can I possibly avoid being grieved and pained by this incredible love I feel for this little one? Surely something is going to go wrong and then I'm just going to feel nothing but grief because of it. How can I bear it? And that terrible longing and that terrible dilemma and the need to, if you like, let go of the desire to clutch up, to close up, to hold on, to control, is I think one of the dilemmas of being a parent. And yet this woman let go of her child, she let him go. And then received him back. She received, if you like, her heart's desire. The Lord gave her child back to her to care for. And we never do find out actually what she called him, because we only hear the name that the Egyptian gave him, Moses, or as it's written in the Bible, Moshe. It's actually a name that's used quite a bit in Egypt. Many pharaohs had that Moshe, you know, part added to their name. As it's written, there's some called Armos or Tutmos or whatever, and they obviously had that component in the name. So this is a very Egyptian kind of name. <clears throat> and then that launches off the career of Moses, who became, if you like, you know, everyone knows Moses. But in that little vignette, we see the compassion of Pharaoh's daughter for the little baby. And it's an essential quality of being able to take care of our children, is the need to have compassion on them. The need to, if you like, bear with the pain of that intense love and the terrible disappointment that at times is going to come with that love. The terrible sense of fear and loss. But also that desire, that compassion, that mercy, that grace, that patience, which we need to have on our little ones, even as they let us down, because they will let us down, and yet we need to just have compassion on them, and be merciful to them. And so all those things are written in such few lines, <laughs> but at the base of it all there is a kind of truth behind all that, the truth of the nature of being a mother the truth of our creation, the truth of being a child, which is true, and it's something worth holding on to. And I wrote a little thing in the parish mag a, uh, a little while ago about live not by lies, about the lies which I think are 
are creeping into our society now, these lies about marriage and all these kinds of things, and they're not true, which is why I'm opposed to them. Because they're not true. But that also means that if we live out the truth of these things, we're living something wholesome and good and upright. Something which is worth doing. And something which ultimately will cause us blessedness. Something which will make actually our lives better. Something which it will be a blessing to those around us. And one of the, if you like, part of the truth of this thing about family life is that if we live as if it is true, if we actually make our priorities and our decisions on the basis that this is in fact true, it will work out better for us. If a woman decides now at school, or a girl says, when I grow up, I want to be a wife and mother. How many women are actually going to own up to that now? How many women are actually going to say, it's my ambition to be a mother? It's not exactly a career path that's promoted in school, is it? And yet there is something deeply true about it. And in the, the TOTS group, we see women who have children are not well prepared for it. But they don't quite know what to do with it when it happens. They don't know how to deal with it. My own wife, Nikki, went into a complete meltdown. I'm going to kind of help her get over it. And that is a role which you, who have gone through all this, can offer these young women. To help them work their way through it. Because you know it's pretty tough at times. It's not easy. And it's not always pleasant. And yet we also know it is basically true. And it's worth doing. And so we need to have compassion on these young women who are struggling to deal with their motherhood. Struggling to deal with their children and work out how they feel about it and what to do about it. And be patient with them and help them to work it out. Because it is true. And it really is worth doing. And it's worth encouraging people not to just put it to one side and put it on a shelf and think, ah, oh, some other day I'll work out about this. Another day, another year, another decade. I'll put it off. But that's not facing reality. That's not dealing with reality. And if it, reality bites back. And so, the scripture says, honour your father and your mother. Moses would, if you like, be obliged honour both the woman who gave him birth and this woman who adopted him because they had compassion on him they suffered for him his mother felt those terrible pangs of loss as she had to put him on the river Pharaoh's daughter felt compassion on him and drew him out of the river and took care of him and provided for him we all have that debt of gratitude to those who have taken care of us, who have had compassion on us, who have shown love to us, who have provided for us, and gone through the pangs and the pains and the agonies of birth and of mercy and kindness to us. And that is true. And that, according to scripture, is worthy of honour. And that too is not always easy. We can feel deeply conflicted at times because life can be very unkind. And yet the Lord would urge us and encourage us to persevere because it is true and because it is good and because it's part of our nature, part of our creation. It's part, if you like, of the wisdom of the reality of the heavens and the earth. And if we would encourage one another to do this, that would be good for us, good for our communities, good for our families, good for our towns, good for our villages. Be good for everyone. I'm not belittling the difficulty of this. But I am saying it's worth doing. Because it is good. The Lord is
is good. He has compassion on our pain, on our suffering. In the reading from Luke, the sword pierced Mary's heart. In the reading from Corinthians, he talks about our consolation and our suffering being bound up together. This is the nature of things, the nature of life. And to understand these things, to receive them and to live with them, is wisdom. The wisdom from heaven. May the Lord bless you and keep you and uphold you as you live according to <coughs> 